it's okay to have mixed emotions, Canada, because that's how I'm feeling. There obviously is a, a, a sense of, of pride. We've all said that we're using the word pride a lot, doing us proud. We're using the words accomplishments a lot, given that this is a team that is the last time they were at the World Cup, gentlemen, I don't know, did the internet exist, right? Like, it's been a long time. So there's a lot <laughs> that they achieved. I don't and it's, it's, it's okay to still feel good. It's also okay to feel bad. Because at the end of the day, as much as they brought us through this incredible ride during World Cup qualifying, it did end after two games. That third game didn't matter to them in the group. They knew they weren't moving on. They do get the historic goal at a men's World Cup, but they don't get that result. It's okay to feel proud and also feel pretty crappy. So I guess the question now, when we look back with these types of, you know, mixed emotions, let's try and pinpoint some things here. Alfonso Davies is the face of the team, Ollie. He's a superstar. He has won many things when it comes, you know, to the footballing world and with Bayern Munich, some massive tournaments. Did you feel that Alfonso Davies, the deployment of him, at this World Cup, does it start to put into question where the best spot is for him on this field? And maybe, at least at this tournament, against this type of competition, didn't nail it. Yeah, I, I think this is a much more open debate going into next year than, than maybe we expected it to be before the World Cup. I think before the World Cup, we were, the consensus was we were all on the same page. Alfonso Davies plays in a high position for Canada. Wing, up front, doesn't matter where it is. You know, we know that's where he wants to play. We know that's where the team has, has most commonly used him. We want to unleash him as an attacking force and, and, and see him hurt teams in that way. I think coming off this tournament, um, I don't think he looked comfortable at times in, in some of those positions. I don't think it helped that he was moved into a number of different positions. He never looked entirely clear what his role was for me at times. And I think there is a much stronger case to be made coming out of this tournament that we do need to think about Alfonso Davies playing a much more familiar position for Canada that he plays for, for his club with, with Bayern Munich. Um, Canada's best performance at this tournament came with Alfonso Davies playing left wing back for the first time in a couple of years. And, and that, I think, is food for thought, you know, going into next year coming out of this because that that's the position he plays, obviously, every week for his club. It's where he knows the tactical responsibilities. It's where he's a massive threat coming from those deeper positions. I think defensively, in a funny way, even though it's a bit more of a withdrawn position, it, it shields him a bit more because he's more. he tends to be more in position rather than having to track back a lot, which I don't think he enjoys doing necessarily as, as more of a winger. Um, so that I definitely think, I don't think there's one definitive answer coming out of this tournament, but I do think we're again going to be discussing in a way that we haven't for the past year or two, should Alfonso Davies maybe play in that deeper role like he does for Bayern Munich uh, in a Canada jersey as well. I think you hit the nail on the head, Ali. Um, the best 45 minutes we saw from Alfonso Davies was the, the first half against Belgium, playing in a comfortable position. I think people underestimate how hard it is to switch. Like, we're not talking about playing center back or right center back and then playing right back. Like, it's similar in a way, right? You're asking a guy who's bombing forward on the left side to maybe start playing right wing or just playing in a position where your back's turned all the time as like a 10 mm -hmm. or a winger, inverted winger. Like, we've seen through this tournament that Canada has quality, but the best run that they had was that first half against Belgium, where I would say the balance was right all throughout the pitch, especially with Alfonso Davies. Play him in the position he plays all the time. Play him in the position that he's comfortable in, and then he can grow into the game and, and do wonders for Canada. I understand that, but... Herdman requires his players to be tactically versatile. Like players are moving all over the field at all different times and they're readily changing. I have no problem Davies playing forward in attack, but I think that you need to have one of him or Tejon Buchanan playing in those attacking areas. Like Tejon Buchanan plays for his club side as a right wing back or a right back at times. He was playing in a forward role. It works for Canada when you're playing in transition. And you have those transition opportunities. The World Cup, guys, is difficult to score goals. And, and perhaps you need some more technical players playing in those areas. As for as for the future, Andy, I think it depends who else emerges. Like, is there a left back of the future, someone else that can play that role that's maybe a step up going forward? We'll see. There's a lot of moving parts here, but mm -hmm. I'm not resigned to pegging Alfonso Davies just to play in one position. Yeah, I think if anything, we're just looking at Alfonso Davies. And sometimes when you're so versatile – Maybe sometimes that can work against you because then your coach can switch you up a little too often. And then to your point, Jordan, maybe you just can't get comfortable. You just can't 
figure that out. Uh, but at the same time, what's been great about this team is that they have been able to react very quickly when John Herdman has changed up tactics a little bit. So let's talk a little John Herdman here, Wheels. This was his first time coaching at a Men's World Cup. How do you think he did? <sighs> Considering the circumstances, I think he did really well. I don't think many people would have thought they would have played against Belgium and dominated the way they did. That second half response against Morocco was very good. The first 20, 25 minutes against Croatia was very good as well. It was just moments that betrayed him and his team. But let's be honest here in this assessment. He was played a crappy hand. A, a player who was arguably one of, if not the most important player to this Canada puzzle, Stephanie Eustachio was not fit throughout this tournament. He came into camp and Ollie, you and I were on a call with John Herman. He mentioned that a player had, was doing crazy numbers and he'd been pushed to the limit coming to camp and he did have concern. Guess what happened with Eustachio? Couldn't play 90 minutes. Couldn't play in the last game. You take away that linchpin from the team, then I think you're a lesser team without him in it. I think there was a knock-on effect, asking too much from individuals in different areas, trying to compensate in other areas as well, and which made this a real challenge. Not to mention MLS players out of season. Not to mention Atiba Hutchinson playing one competitive game for his club side, 39 years old, coming into camp. Not to mention Alfonso Davies in his hamstring. Like, look, there was critical pieces that weren't at full strength and meaning that John Herdman probably couldn't play the way that he actually wanted to play. So all things considered, I think he did very well. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of that. And I'll give you one pro and, and one con um, from from what I've made of, of, of how John Herdman has managed this tournament. I think firstly, there's been a lot of criticism or I've seen some criticism of, of the way he's approached games. You know, why don't Canada play three midfielders? Why aren't they more tight and compact and play a bit deeper and so on? I, I think that doesn't really understand that John Herdman and his staff, I believe, looked at this tournament not wanting to just get just get a point, just get one result somewhere. They wanted to get out of the group, and, and everything was designed around getting out of the group. And I think the only way that they felt they could do that, obviously you have to win at least one game against one of these great teams to do that, is, is you have to take a lot of risk. You have to play to the team's strengths, which is make the game really fast, make it chaotic, make it transitional, disrupt their rhythm by pressing really high, the high defensive line has to go with that as well. So there's a ton of risk in that approach, and ultimately it hasn't worked out for various reasons, many of which Gareth just mentioned. But I don't think it was illogical as, as an overall mindset going into the tournament to, to try and get out of the group. Um, the, the one criticism I'll have, or, or, or the con, um, I don't think he got the best out of his best two players at this tournament, and, and Alfonso Davies and Jonathan Davids. And that, to me, is, you know, we've touched on it, but that's going to become... I think interesting to see how he handles going forwards. This has been a team where there's been a lot of tactical versatility, a lot of positional switches, a lot of rotating players in and out of the lineup. Like you said, Andy, sometimes David starts a game and then misses a game. I think we need to think a lot more in, in the coming year or two about how do we build the attack around these two and Tejon Buchanan and, and get them on the pitch every game, get the best out of them as a combination, figure out those relationships. I just didn't think they were quite there at this tournament. Yeah. And we're also going to look ahead. Uh, we have a lot to dissect here when it comes to Canada and the pressing issues and maybe some changes and things that you want to see before 2026. But at the same time, there, there were bright spots here, Jordan. When you look at this again, you're looking at this Canadian team who a lot of Canadians, by the way, were exposed to for the very first time. What were some of those bright spots? I think the bright spots you can see, even though there were... Um... Uh, a massive amount of, of goals for Canada, but the bravery that the team played with and also just knowing that a lot of attacking players will be in their prime or will be playing four years from now or three and a half years from now. I think that's a bright spot. I think to go into a tournament where you were heavy underdogs, but to play like you could win every match, I think that says something about the character of a group. Uh, I'm not too sure how many other the 31 teams in the tournament would if they were in Canada's shoes, would go into the games the same way they did. But they played their style. They played with their heart on their sleeve. I think that's the bright spot. I think that now is the point where you build off of. The, the issues of not winning games or not getting a point were coming down to small, like, minuscule details that need to be fixed. But the heart, you can't teach that. That's something that you either have or you don't. So I think with that team going into that, the sky's the limit for the future because if that remains the base – the rest can be taught. 
Yeah, t- two quick bright spots from me. F- firstly, the performance of a few individuals who I think are going to progress their careers in the club game. Tejon Buchanan being the big one. Alistair Johnston as well. Kamal Miller in the first game I thought was terrific. And, you know, I don't think they did themselves any harm. And, and then the second one, and pa- probably the biggest one for me, the Belgian performance. The Belgian performance was was outstanding. It's as good as we've ever seen this team play. I know it's kind of been dampened by what's happened since and just the the nature of it being the first game. Um, but that was a tremendous performance regardless of result. That was a new standard, I think, for Canada in terms of the way they played in that game. I, I agree with all that. I'll add part of the World Cup is qualifying. Don't Do not forget that. Like <laughs> World Cups are supposed to be hard to get to. Until now. <laughs> well, yeah, until well 2026. <laughs> but, but I mean, that, that journey getting here has Canada believing. It's completely reset the conversation around men's soccer in this country, which, which is absolutely refreshing. And I actually think that Canada are a little bit of a victim of their own, their own hype, their own expectations heading in. They were completely reset. I'm not talking about a 2-1 win over Japan. It's the way that they navigated themselves and probably punched above their weight during World Cup qualifying. And then everyone expects them to go out and contend against Belgium and the, the runners-up from the from the 2018 World Cup in Morocco, who had a 31-game unbeaten streak heading into earlier this year. And as top-class players, like I didn't expect Canada to go out and win a game, to be honest with you. I thought it was going to be a feel-good story if they scored a goal. That, that's the conversation we were having on this show and if they were able to compete. And I think that they proved that they can compete. Yes, they made some mistakes. Yes, they missed the penalty. Yes, there was moments that they didn't capitalize on. But overall, I'm feeling pretty good about Canadian soccer right now in the direction that we're heading. 